Hello everybody, uh, I'm super excited to be here. Um, so as Brian mentioned, this program I'm playing for you today is kind of the history of the Fandango. I've, I might even maybe say it's more so trying to tie together classical guitar and flamenco guitar a little bit, just because they, they have a lot of close ties, but it's, it's hard to find those ties. One of the reasons is because flamenco is very, uh, it's an oral tradition that's passed on um, and not really much is written down at all. So it's hard to trace, but there's been a lot of really good academic work that's been going on lately and people have started to kind of find some ties. Um, and this whole idea for, of mine started because I would hear about, uh, and I, I've spent a lot of time living in Spain and um, I initially studied flamenco over there and I would hear about this type of fandango, and this type of fandango, and this type of fandango, and this type, and there were all these different types, and then I'd play a classical fandango from the Renaissance period, and I was so confused because they all sounded so different. So I'm like, okay, how do these fit together? What's, what's the story here? So I'm gonna try to paint at least a musical picture for you. I mean, I could probably bore you to death with a lecture forever, um, but instead of doing that, I'll just kind of paint that picture through the music, and then you'll sort of start to see the, the tree split apart between flamenco and classical. Um, and I'm going to try to kind of musically show you a classical version and then a flamenco version that is somewhat similar, just so you can kind of see the similarities and the differences. And so it'll be pretty fun. So we'll start with the earliest written fandango for guitar, written around 1710 by the Baroque guitarist Santiago de Murcia. And um, this, you'll see it's much more sparse. It's very light in feel. The, the, the Baroque guitar itself is much smaller. It only has five strings. Um, but you'll start to see the beginnings of the Fandango. And by the way, the Fandango, we don't know too much about how it was, it was a dance, it came from the Americas, um, at least that's the prevailing theory. You'll often hear it starting with big strummed chords, and it's a lot of variations over just kind of two chords. And it usually started on a D minor chord, and an A major chord. Just back and forth between those two chords. So you'll get a lot of those two chords in the next few minutes. <laughs> Okay, so this is the Fandango by Santiago de Murcia. written almost 
almost 120 or so years later. So much later, after the Fandango became super popular in Spain, super popular all throughout Europe, and then kind of started to lose popularity. This is a famous guitarist named Dionisio Agualo, and he's kind of writing a Fandango after its time, but he's remembering a lot of, uh, you might say, falsetas, if you're thinking about flamenco, or variations that he learned from the past, writing them all down, and then he's doing it in his own very romantic style. So there's kind of a, an introduction that doesn't sound like a Fandango at all, and then there's a finale that doesn't sound like a Fandango at all in between. But in the middle, once again, D minor and A. So this is a, the introduction and Fandango by Dionisio Aguado.
school fandangos. Um, one of the characteristics you might have heard in this piece is a lot of switching back and forth between a feeling of being in three beats, one, two, three, one, and uh, six beats, one, two, three, four, five, six, one. So you get a lot of this Spanish, it's called hiniola. So it's either, you can either think of it as a one, two, three, one, two, three, or a one, two, one, two, one, two. And um, this is really evident in one of the flamenco fandangos in a region of Spain that is it's kind of super preserved uh, over the years, much more than other regions where the Fandango has evolved and changed. And this is uh, the region of Huelva in Spain. And that's kind of in the southeast of Spain. So this is a, a really typical Fandango from Spain, Fandangos de Huelva. And what you'll see is you'll see the typical chord pattern of basically um, the one chord and the five chord, but in this case, it's in a different key now. So now we have A minor instead of D minor, and E instead of A. But, you know, it's really the same thing. Just one chord and the five chord, back and forth. And then, of course, because it's flamenco, over the years, people innovate, they get exciting rhythms, they change it up a little bit. So um, it's, you know, they'll change the chords on different beats, and it'll kind of throw you off, and you might say to yourself at the end of this, that doesn't sound anything like what I just <laughs> heard the last two pieces. But that's, uh, that's, just sort of how it goes. And the same tradition of variation after variation after variation is a similar thing here. And in flamenco, those are called falsettas. So after a little bit of strumming of the chords, we'll return to some variations uh, based around those chords or falsettas, and then I'll go back to the chords, back to a variation, etc. cetera. Um, and then in keeping with the tradition of flamenco, uh, I'm gonna be kind of, kind of improvising some pre-thought out ideas, but as far as when I play them, I'm not 100% sure what the order will be, so it's always a it's always a little more fun that way, right? So these are fandangos de huelva.
going to deviate from just Van Angos and kind of see how things began to split off. So one of the first ties that has been sort of painted between um, really early traditional folk dances like a fandango or a jota or many other Spanish dances and traditional flamenco as we know it is the connection between the fandango and solea in flamenco. Um, and some of the similarities, um, well one of the main similarities includes this idea of kind of switching between rhythms of, like I was saying earlier, one, two, three, one, two, three, and then one, two, one, two, one, two. Now, you, again, you probably won't notice it too much in the music here because the music is very slow and freely played now, but uh, that, among other things, like the traditional flamenco harmonies, uh, chords, will be present here. Um, I like starting or <coughs> playing early in a program, so yeah, because it's, it's a very deep, deep uh, branch of flamenco and uh, has a lot of emotion and power and uh, paints a really nice picture. So this is uh, Solea. Once again, this will be a lot of improvisation. Some things that uh, I wrote, some things that teachers of mine in Spain have written, teachers of mine here. It's kind of a hodgepodge of everything. So this is uh, Solea. <laughs> Thank you. 
at this point, I think it would be really fun, or I thought it would be really fun to uh, just kind of show you some pairings of a piece in the classical world and how it was maybe a, a flamenco counterpart and how they've um, come together. So try to think about a couple of pieces, maybe some that you might have heard before, maybe some that you haven't heard before. The first I thought of that has been imitated quite a bit is the traditional dance of Sevillanas from Sevilla. Um, so I'm going to start with the flamenco part of it just because it's in an easier tuning. <laughs> But it also gives an advantage because I can give you something to listen for. So if you listen for the, how the music goes, it'll go, you'll hear an introduction of chords, and then you'll hear some musical material, and then it'll go back to the chords. And so it's kind of like everything <clears throat> begins and ends with chords, and then the music is in between. Uh, kind of common in a lot of flamenco, actually. So uh, when you see me play the piece after this, which is uh, Isaac Alveni's <coughs> Sevilla, um, you'll see it's modeled entirely after Sevillanas in a similar thing. It has this sort of chord-like intro, and then musical material, and then back to the chords. And there are some other things I'll point out when I get to that piece. But this is uh, Sevillana, written by uh, the great flamenco guitarist Paco Cortez from Sevilla, uh, living in Sevilla. Uh, oh, I should mention one other thing, too. Um, this, when you play, Sevillana normally is meant, meant to be danced, sung, all kinds of people together. That's how all of flamenco is meant to be played. So sometimes we have to make compromises on the guitar, play things a little differently. The a guitar Sevillana tends to be in four different keys. So each time you'll think that I've ended, and then I'll just <laughs> start it again in a different key. So uh, you may have to you, you may have to just wait till I look up and smile all the way to, to know that I'm done. <laughs> But uh, it's, it, there'll be four little mini songs here. Watch for These are Sevillanas.
talked to Isaac Albeni's version of Sevillanas. He even subtitled the piece Sevilla, Sevillanas. And I'm going to have to talk about a couple of things on this because I need to retune my guitar and I want to secretly give my guitar some time to uh, adjust. So, like I said, you'll hear the chord like intro and then melodic material and then finishing out that chord like material again. And then there's this very quiet, relaxed, beautiful middle section. And um, I've played a lot of Albanese music over the years, and I think that in addition to um, just writing Spanish music, he also likes to kind of paint imagery uh, of whatever region he might be writing about. And one of the beautiful things about Sevilla is um, they have during, well, I want to say the month of April, they have Semana Santa. It's the same, same week as Easter, so I guess it changes around. Um, and uh, during Semana Santa, uh, they have all these, these processions and these really, really fascinating things that happen. And one of the things that happen is uh, there's a certain procession where a, a gypsy will come out on a balcony and sing an unaccompanied flamenco melody called a saeta. And it sounds really similar to the Muslim call to prayer. Uh, it's very long melodies that go all over the place. Really cool, really beautiful. And I kind of feel like the middle section is imitating a little bit of a saeta, and then it kind of brings things back again. So listen for all those things. You can listen for a, a flamenco solo melody. You can listen for chords and musical material back and forth, all of that in, in Sevilla. And if any of you have been to Sevilla or seen pictures of it, you can imagine that too. I know some of you in the audience have been.
of pieces these don't directly go together but again I uh, wanted to focus on that idea of going between three and six or three and two you know, the one two three one two three one two one two one two maybe you didn't hear it with the solea but I bet you'll hear it here this is a rondeña and it's a classical stylized rondeña uh, rondeña is just an, um, something that happens in flamenco I, I should probably clarify with this is it's like a big tree and all these branches coming out of the tree are different sort of sub-styles of flamenco that have names. It might be from the region, or it might just have some sort of meaning. That's why Soleá is a part of flamenco. Fandango de Huelva are flamenco. Uh, Rondeña is technically flamenco, but this will be a classicalized version of it. And then uh, I'm going to pair it with Bulerías, which is also a little bit faster and rhythmic. And uh, you'll see all of that, how those these twos and these threes jump together. So this is the, the clearest example I can think of is this Rondeña. This is by a composer called Regino Sanz de la Massa.
uh, hope you've enjoyed a little bit of Spanish music on both sides of the coin here. Uh, and as is customary in a flamenco show, you got to end with bulerias. That's one of those branches from flamenco. It's more exciting. It's more fun. It's got a little bit faster of a rhythm. Um, and what I'm going to do here, again, it's chords, chords, and then a falsetta, or kind of a uh, melodic part, and then chords again, and melodic part. Um, and I'm going to play a couple of really older historical falsettas, and then I'll just kind of make them newer and newer and newer, including uh, one of my own, and then I'll finish out with, uh, you know, something kind of new. Uh, it'll be a little bit improvised, especially the chords in between. But uh, Bulerias is, is very fun. It's a little weird playing flamenco in general, but especially with yes, without somebody up here clapping or, or dancing. rhythms and dancing. Yes, but uh, I'll do the, I'll do the best I can to keep it lively here. So we'll see how it goes. You need castanets. Yeah, I need somebody with castanets. Come here, we're gonna stop. This is a good stage for stopping the feet. So <laughs> now we don't have any dancers. <laughs>
know, another short one for you. This is a piece that I wrote. It's a granaina. It's flamenco. Um, and uh, again, thanks for coming out. Thanks for sticking around. Um, I think Brian mentioned, but uh, I've got an email list out there, and I'd love it if you jumped on it. Um, I can let you know when I'm, there's other things going on, whether it's a solo concert. I also play in a duo sometimes, and we're going to be playing in L.A. soon. Uh, and then I'm also going to be coming out with a couple of beginner guitar courses. One is sort of like an introduction to flamenco, um, as well as uh, a note reading on the guitar course. So if you guys are interested in um, being notified when I come out with that, it'll be in a few months. Uh, just sign up on the list and I'll let you know when it's out. Uh, so yeah, this is a granaina and it's called Amimare. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. 